during the last minute adjustment, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> all righty. Well, I could hear your, all your voices this morning. That was really awesome. I enjoyed that very much. I'm sure God did as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, crazy times, so crazy measures, but we're all here. We're gathered in God's house, and we're going to hopefully continue to sing God's praises. We're going to hear from God's word this morning. So why don't you do me a favor and grab a copy of God's word. If you don't have your Bible with you, there's a bunch of them right here on this little table right next to Star. See them there? Grab a copy of God's word and turn to Acts chapter 11. All right, Acts chapter 11. We're going to actually start in verse 19. Now, uh, while you're turning there, you know, we're, we're in this together, right? right? People ask me sometimes, what does your church believe? And what they're really asking me is what I believe. And what I always tell them is, why don't you come and ask everybody? Because we're all different. As I'm often fond of saying, I quote that scripture, I believe it's in Ephesians, that God has placed us all together so that each person does their own special work. It helps the others to grow. And then the whole church is healthy, growing, full of love. So we're actually all in this together. We are Revolution Church, okay? We're, we're in this together. Now, all of us have to do their own special work, and I do my special work, my Special work, I, you know, a couple of things that I'll do. I like making coffee for everybody. But my main job is to, to preach, to preach God's word. And so since God's word says that his word, he says this of his own word, that God uses it to equip all of his people to do every good work. So the greatest job that I could do would be to share God's word with you every single opportunity that I get to do so. And you let me do that again this morning, and I'm appreciative of that. Let me just tell you a little bit about just this one person, just so you can understand my special job and what I'm supposed to do, okay? I'm the preacher, and I am a, this might sound foreign to some, I'm an expositional preacher, okay? An expositional preacher, uh, let me tell you what that is, you know, this is maybe boring, but it's necessary, okay? Because mm -hmm. it's going to explain a lot of what we do here as a church family. An expositional preacher assumes two things. First and foremost, that they assume, I assume, that this, God's word, is actually that. God's very words disclosing himself to his people. It explains to us who he is, his nature, his character, what he likes, what he dislikes, what he expects, right, who he is. And it also tells us who we are. And it tells us who we are before we bend the knee to Christ as Lord and Savior. And then it tells us who we are after we've bent the knee to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the expectations that he has for his people once bending the knee. Okay? So the Bible is, right? Okay, that's one. That's, that's God's actual word. The second thing is, is that I assume that God has spoken his words in the manner and order that he desires. Okay? So that means not only is the content perfect, but the order of it is perfect as well. So the Bible is, is not only perfect in content, but in order. Okay? So that means I'm not a week-to-week -week topical God. Now, I don't, I don't get in a room alone with God and say, okay, God, what do our people need to hear this week? What's going on in the news that the that the Bible speaks to, that they need to hear about. So I'm not going to preach on the coronavirus and how to respond to that. That's not my number one job. I will, however, go topical on occasion if I'm over amount of time. I'm very impressed of God to preach on a topic. Like the last couple of weeks, I preached what? The kingdom. Yeah. Because as I'm reading in the Gospels, it's just Jesus just hammering kingdom the kingdom the kingdom the kingdom so i'm like okay i get it you want me to talk about the kingdom all right so i did that but most of the time i will preach through books of the bible so over time i will be in prayer and if i feel impressed in a slow methodical lengthy period feel like hey you need to preach this book like the book of acts i'm like okay god i submit to that and then you preach through the book of acts not week in, week out, trying to figure out what you're going to talk about, okay? So an expositional preacher has the job of exposing the message of the text that's been chosen 
in the context that it appears within the larger context of all scripture points to me. That's what Jesus said of the entire Bible. That's in John 5, 39. So proper preaching leaves very little room for opinion. So when I say that it's in the proper context and it just says this, like things like last week when I was talking about, if you remember, um, you get forgiven on the cross when he goes to the cross for you, right? And you say yes to that. Amen? Amen. But at the same time, he says, however, if you don't forgive your brother or sister like I've forgiven you, right, my heavenly father won't forgive you. And, and we hear that, and it's like, man, that just rubs me wrong. I don't like that. That's not what my denomination taught. That's not what my grandmother taught. My grandma told me that when I'm forgiven on the cross, it's for everything past, present, future. That's it, bar none. But yet Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, my Father won't forgive you. And so you hear the exposition preacher say, you can't just ignore that. Or you have to do something with that. You can't just obey your denominational bent or your tradition and say, well, this is what I think, and I don't care what Jesus says. The, the expositional preacher exposes what the text says, and now it's up to you to act upon it, but it's up to me to let it out. So exposition, expository preaching, means that scriptures that you don't like to hear and scriptures I don't like to teach still get read, they still get taught, because the preacher at any church is only the herald of the king's message, Amen. not the message Amen. of his own. Okay? That's what a preacher does. Now I'm saying all this for a reason, because I know people, I've been doing this now for 15 years, I know, I know people, and I understand what ticks them off, and I understand what people complain about in a church. A million things, but there's a consistent thing. When a sermon rubs someone wrong and they don't like that certain subject, they complain about it, right? And usually their complaint is displayed by their departure. That's what happens most awful, often. Awful is right. Freudian slip. <laughs> right? Now listen, if you're a topical preacher, then, then departure is a little bit more likely and acceptable only because of this. Not that topical preachers aren't great. There's some great ones out there. But here's the thing. When you're a topical preacher, you have an idea. You have a belief. And what you do is you go through the scriptures and you find Bible verses that's, that can support your opinion. And that is very dangerous because that could happen. We're all prone to that on occasion, okay? So, so week after week, you start hearing the same message because the preacher has a bent. And he's going to prove his bent by using proof text scriptures from all, all over the Bible, okay? So, maybe, just maybe when that happens, the preacher's opinion can start to bleed into the text. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But if you're an expositional preacher, committed and submitted to the content and the order that God has ordained in his book, then two things will happen, okay? First thing is, if you're mature enough, I'm calling you out, if you're mature enough to sit in your seat and stay, you will eventually hear the full counsel of God. Amen. Okay? Amen. You will eventually get to it. Here's the other thing. If, someone get, if something gets repeated and you don't like it, it's because God repeated it. Right. right? And I'm often yeah. fond of saying that God doesn't repeat himself because he forgot he said it. He repeats himself because you forgot he said it. Right? So when you're really struggling in algebra, let's say, right? I'm struggling in algebra. I'm struggling in algebra. You don't rush out and get a tutor or get extra help in U.S. history. Right? You go get a tutor and get extra help in algebra. Right? Algebra, algebra, al How many people like algebra? Ah. You're crazy. <laughs> I hated algebra. And if you don't, I don't even know if you're saved. <laughs> I'm just saying algebra is horrible. Nobody really likes algebra, right? Come on. But if you struggle in it, what do you need to do? Get extra help in social studies? No. You get extra help in algebra. And all the while, you hate being extra help in algebra. But you know, if you're going to get an A in algebra, you need to get extra yeah. help Amen. in algebra, yeah. right? Yeah. So as we venture back into the book of Acts to find two things, I hope you remember this, truth shared and examples shown, right? 
Truth shared example shown. Why? It's to let these two things, as they are written in God's word, in the order that they appear, help those, th those things to help us shape our response as a people here in 2020 at Revolution, shape our response to who Jesus is, what he taught, what he said, where he went. That's the, so if you go to the Gospel of Luke, Luke says, hey, this is who Jesus is. This is what he taught, right? And then he finishes that book and he starts writing the book of Acts. Why? This is how people are supposed to respond to who Jesus is. Amen. So we look in the book of Acts to find truth shared and examples shown. And so my responsibility, my sole responsibility, is to expose the truth of the text and the directives of the text. That's it. That's my job. Now your job as the hearer of this is listen to be mature enough to hear it all and then as James would say don't just be a hearer but to be a doer of what you hear okay now I'm saying all this so you can trust what we do here at Revolution Church so that we can uh, we can be a healthy church and accomplish the mission that God has given us listen loved ones to pastor this city that's what we're supposed to do this church is to pastor the city. This church is supposed to be a city on a hill. This church is supposed to care for and love and guide and protect and lead this city. That's our job, okay? So when you preach this way, listen up. When you preach this way, I understand that people get rubbed the wrong way because you get to a Bible section and you're like, I don't want to hear about that. And we talk about this all the time, but it's so common. Like if you talk about giving, how many people like real, let's be honest, they'll, they'll be churchy, okay? People really like giving up 10% of their income. Okay. I don't. You guys are all the holy ones. I don't like it. I'm broke. It, it hurts to give. But he's constantly saying it in scripture. Why? Because I need help with that. Because even though I've been a pastor for 15 years, it's never easy to give up money that I know I need. Now, does he always, is he always faithful to that? Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I'm a stubborn Jew. So I don't like doing it. I haven't learned my lesson yet. Am I doing it every month? Yeah, but do I, am I always thrilled about it? No. I don't like some of the stuff in the Bible. I don't like preaching some of the stuff in the Bible. And I know you guys. We have a relationship. We're friends. So I know the areas that you struggle with. And I know what comes up next in the Bible. And I'm like, oh, crap. He's not going to like this one. I mean, my, my wife and I, we'll, we'll talk about these things. Like, She knows what I'm going to preach, and she's like, so uh, what did so-and-so think about that? Did they leave? I'm like, no, they didn't. They actually seemed to receive it pretty well. Now, because we kind of know what's going to rub people wrong. You get to know in relationship with them. But when you preach this way, these subjects come up and people get tired of hearing them. And I get that. But what happens is on that Sunday, when they come in, when they hear the word proclaimed, as it's stated, in its context, in that order, and people don't like it, it's because they're being corrected and rebuked. Because they haven't submitted to that word yet. Right? But if that same word comes out, let's go back to money. If you're a faithful tither, and then you're not only tithing, but you're giving offerings above and beyond that, and then the preacher gets to that section again, and it's like, God's talking about giving again. Amen. Right? But listen... How many people love to get affirmed that what they're doing is right? We all do. Right? Everybody does. So, so when you come in and the preacher's talking about money again, I'm not going to talk about money really, but I'm just saying that's an example. The preacher's talking about money again, and like, ah, that's all they want is their money. Yeah, because you don't tithe. Someone who does is going, that same word is now encouragement. Amen. Right? Because they're like, hey, I'm doing well. And God's saying, hey, add a boy, add a girl. You're doing what I said to do, man. So everybody loves to be affirmed. But the one who's not submitting to the word, it just seems like that subject keeps coming up, doesn't it? Because you're stubborn. Yeah. Because God knows you're not good at algebra, and he keeps <laughs> offering extra help. <laughs> and, and, and you're never going to get it until you submit. Okay? So, that's expositional preaching. Okay? An expositional preacher gets a section of the Bible, a book of the Bible, and he goes through it. No matter what. You know what one of the biggest divisions in all the churches? Some of you might not even care, but 
There's this thing called Reformed theology, and then there's Arminian theology. It's the ones who think that God's in charge of every single, positively everything, and we have like no really free will. And then there's these guys over here who think that it's, no, we have free will to make whatever choice we want. And you know where that battleground is? Mostly it's in Romans chapter 8 and 9. That's the battleground. So years ago, I, I, like he won't stop telling me, preach Romans, preach Romans, preach Romans. I'm like, I'm not preaching Romans. I don't want to divide the church. We only have 50 people in the church. What do you want to do? Divide it into 25 and go out of business. Preach Romans. So I preached Romans. Did it. Right? It worked out fine. Mm -hmm. But there's stuff in there I didn't want to preach, right? Because I knew when I get there, I have my own bent. And it's going to be difficult for me to not bleed into the text. But to, to preach it faithfully, just say, this is what it says. Do what you want with it. That's hard because you know it's going to tick people off. But that's what an expositional preacher does. He just goes through the section of the Bible, and whatever it says, he just says it, and that's it. Okay? That's unapologetic preaching of God's Word. So here we are in Acts chapter 11. See all that just like an intro. Acts chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 19. And if you're a, a, a great member of a church, and I know that you all are, you want to hold your pastor accountable. If he says he's going to do something, then dang it, you need to do it, right? And if he doesn't, you need to come to me and talk to me about it. So if you are a careful note taker, which I know every single one of you are, you're going to know that the last place that we ended up in the book of Acts wasn't where I'm starting out. The last time I preached in the book of Acts was in chapter 10. And here you are, exposition guy, saying you're going to preach through every single part of the Bible without fail and you're going to be faithful to it. But here's the difference. Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius, Peter, the sheet comes down, Cornelius calls for him, Peter goes, shares the gospel, everyone gets saved, you're Gentiles, but he does it anyway, they get saved, you remember all that? Yeah. Okay. In the next section of scripture, the beginning of Acts chapter 11, that's all Peter's doing is telling someone what happened. <laughs> and he says the exact same thing again. Now, I'm not all about preaching the same exact sermon again. I don't mind reaching the same topic again if it appears in a different situation, different setting, different story, same topic. I'm not going to avoid it. But that chapter, the beginning of chapter 11, is the exact verbatim to what happened in Acts chapter 10. And I'm not afraid of that teaching. It's on YouTube. You can go to our channel and watch it. So you're not going to miss anything from that section. The next section is Acts chapter 11, verse 19, okay? And so that's what I want to share with you this morning, 19 through 21. You ready? You there? Yeah. Okay. So he said we're going to be our, his faithful witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so this book of Acts is about our response and obeying that command to go make disciples and be a witness to the ends of the earth. And so here we see the church begin to spread so that's why we're studying this, so we can see what they believed and what they did, so we can continue this great mission to reach the ends of the earth. And so here, verse 19, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, you remember the story of Stephen? Yeah. He preached the gospel, he preaches Jesus, and they stone him to death. So there's a little bit of fear there's a heavy persecution going through the through Jerusalem, and so the Jews start to the Jews that have been converted they start to to disperse to different areas. There's persecution after Stephen's death, and they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord. Jesus. Let me pause it for a second. This is so cool. You know, um, Paul said, um, I think it was to Timothy, you've heard these things that I've taught. Now I want you to find trustworthy men and women and pass on what I've taught to them so they can pass it on to other people. And we call that here disciples that make disciples, right? That's the job of the church. Pass on the word of God to others so that they might in turn pass it on to others. Now watch what happens here. The, 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 they get dispersed from Jerusalem and they go to Phoenicia, um, Antioch of Syria and Cyprus. Okay, bring up that map, Joshua. Do you hear me? Yeah, bring that map. You guys see this here? See this here? So they're down here in Jerusalem. This is where it all starts. This is where, this is where Jesus is crucified and resurrected, all that kind of stuff, right down here, right? And the church starts here. And then there's persecution here. And so people, because Jesus said you'd be my witnesses, to what? 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem here. Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. Watch what happens. They're in Jerusalem. Judea, that's where that is. Samaria, that's up here. And they start to go where? Right here. Phoenicia, Antioch of Syria, and Cyprus. Some of them took a boat, went out there. And they start preaching to the Jews. And they get saved, right? But then what? look at the next verse. What happens? However, some people from Cyprus, look, they went here, here, and here. They preached. And then some people from Cyprus went here also and said, I'm not just going to preach to Jews. I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. And a bunch of them get saved. You read it there in the text. So you see how people heard the message. They found trustworthy men and women. And they passed on the truth to them, and then they went and passed it on to other people. You see how it's working? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're supposed to do. Follow the example found in the book of Acts. Okay? So, it says here in verse 21, the power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. Okay? When the church of Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch, when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and, when, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. You know who Saul is, right? Yes. Yep. Who's Saul? Paul. Paul, right. When he found him... He brought him back to Antioch. Now, Antioch doesn't get a lot of talk in churches. But Antioch is a massively important city. Because he said, you're going to be my witnesses, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, look. Look where they are here, right? But Antioch is right here, where there's like a T, right? So now, all of a sudden, the gospel can go here over to, to Asia and, and all these other areas around this, this uh, Mediterranean Sea. So Italy, you know, Roman Empire, Greece, all that, right? And also can go this way. So it was a massively important area. And that's where the, the church of Jesus Christ, that's where we became Christians. It was the first time anyone started to identify us by the one who was leading us, Christ. Okay, we were first followers of the way. Now we are called Christians, and it started right there in Antioch. It's a big, important city. Okay, uh, let's read on. Um, then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And there you see it. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. Busy place there, isn't it? One of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit told him something. And he said that there was a great famine coming to the entire Roman world. The whole Roman Empire was going to be in famine. And in my Bible, I don't know about yours, but there's a parenthesis and it gives us a historical fact here that that actually was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. Because God's never wrong, right? Right. Verse 29, so the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters, the Christians in Judea, back there in Jerusalem, right? Everyone giving as much as they could. They did this, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Okay, so again, we're, we're, just, we're just reading this so that we could glean from it truth shared and then examples shown so we know how we should live our lives as Christians, okay? That's, we're letting this form who we are. That's what God's word is for. So just going to just draw attention to some of the things there in the text. You may have seen them, you may have not. First thing I've noticed, expect persecution, okay? Expect persecution. Stephen stood up for Jesus. He spoke the truth, and there was massive persecution. Now listen, loved ones. I haven't experienced anything like Stephen experienced but just this week alone, sharing with our um, online world, which is, no comment. We're having church. Like, we're the most hated bunch in town right now. Do you guys know that? Yes. Amen. Hated. Oh, yeah. Everyone, online. I shared this with you last week. I should go to hell. I should go to the bowels of hell. I should be arrested for manslaughter. 
I'm a, I can't use the word, but it starts with an F. It sounds like fire truck, buffoon. I'm stupid. What's wrong with you people? You're all about the money. You didn't even take an offering last week. Right? Just, yeah, I know exactly. You should go online and say that. 24 grand a year, yo. Loaded. Deep pockets. Right? Being arrested for having church. Yeah. So, so listen, I understand what it's like to be persecuted to be a, just to be a Christian. Because I just, yes. that's all I want to do is just Amen. do what the Bible says, right? Yes. Hebrews yes. 10, chapter 25 says, don't neglect gathering. There's no asterisk there. It just don't, don't for, neglect to gather. So do we need to gather in a sanctuary? Obviously not. Can we gather in homes? Can we gather in a parking lot? Can we gather in a church? Absolutely, you can gather by the, listen, Jesus gathered by the hillside. Right. He gathered by the lakeside. He gathered on the lake. That's where he did it, right? He gathered in, they gathered in the temple every day, which is just a building, just like this, right, in a temple. They gathered in homes every day. They gathered in the lecture hall of Tyrene. It's just a, a municipal building where philosophers and everyone would get up and wax eloquent about what they believed. And Paul got up there and he did it. He did it everywhere. That's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. Congregate everywhere and spread God's kingdom. So, listen, I know what it's like to be persecuted, but the last thing you want to do is when someone persecutes you is give them your opinion. Right. Nobody cares about my opinion or your opinion, but look at the text, okay? When they were persecuted, did they lay down and say, okay, what did they do? They preached the word of God. That's what it says, right? They preached the word of God. So you expect persecution as a Christian, but you respond to that with the bold proclamation of God's word. That doesn't mean just from a pulpit. That means out of your mouth. Yeah. Your mouth. Your mouth. Everyone's mouth who's sitting here right now. Bold proclamation in response to persecution, right? And look how God, you know, in sports it's like, like there's a goal and then someone gets the assist. Watch how God gets the assist right here, right? And I'm sure it's actually the other way around. We get the assist, but let's just look at the text. What does it say here? Persecution they respond by preaching the word of God. And what happens? Verse 21. The power of the Lord was with them. Amen. Right? So not Amen. just the, the Old Testament, New Testament scripture that says, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. But more than that, in the face of persecution, when you boldly proclaim God's word back into the face of opposition, God's not just presence, his power is with you. Amen. His power is with you, okay? Amen. So so listen, Proverbs 17, 27 says, listen. The wise use few words. Amen. The wise use few words. Yes. So the response here biblically is don't give them your opinion. Don't start running off at the mouth your opinion and you're a jerk and, and don't pick on that guy and you're stupid. And you Listen, they may be stupid, but they don't need to. No one needs to hear that they're stupid. You know what they need to hear? The life transforming word of God. That's what they need to hear. OK, so less arguing, less opinion more quoting, right? More quoting. And I tried to model my, minute, my teaching ministry after that right there. That's why it's tons of Bible all the time. Arguing, I found, I don't know about you, and I'm still guilty of this because I get baited in often because I get pretty passionate about what I believe. And I don't like when people, I don't like when people say ugly things about my Savior and his bride. That's so you're his bride. Amen. Let me tell you something. You say something bad about my wife, you just said something bad about me. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So, so when you say something about the bride, you just said something about Jesus. And Jesus feels the same way. Remember what, what, when, when Paul's persecuting the people, right? What does Jesus say? Why are you persecuting me? Amen. Right? His bride is inseparable from him. Amen. They're one and the same. Right? As I often say that Christ was the visible image of the invisible God, well, now that Christ has gone and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, we, the bride, are the visible image of the invisible Christ. We are Christ yeah. here on this earth. Yeah. And so when you pick on his church, you picked on him. You pick on Jesus, you tick off Moses. That's just the way it is, right? So sometimes I fall and I get baited in. I need to not so much. But arguing is just the endless clash of opinion. Yes. But the word of God is alive and powerful. It's God breathed and it's able to show us what's right and wrong. I'm not. Right? Only God's word can do that. It Amen. is the truth standard. 
And so when fear and opinion and pride are set aside and you open your mouth and you share the word of God that has been taught to you with another person, God's power is in that. Okay? So you need to open your mouth. That should have been a great place for an amen. Amen. God's power is in that. Amen. Amen. Let's try that the first time next time. So you want to hear what God's word says about God's word? This is what God says about his own word. Isaiah 55, 11. So it is with my word. I send it out and it always, say always. 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 It always produces fruit. Yes. It, will, it will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. So whether Amen. it's out of his mouth or out of your mouth, if you're quoting this, don't give your own opinion about something. Expect to slap the Holy Spirit's name on it and, and it's assume it's the same power. Because it's not. You preach these words in the face of persecution, God's power is in that. Amen. Okay? Amen. And it always produces what it promises to produce. Look at verse 21 there. What does it say in verse 21? The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of the Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. There was power in the words of the persecuted Christians. Persecution says, don't do this, right? Don't do this. But they obeyed God and not man. Amen. And as a result, what happened? Not just one or two people got saved. A large number of Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. It says later on in this text that they stayed there a year and they preached to what? Little crowds like this? What were they? Large crowds, right? Not just a person or two got saved, which we rejoice in all, with all the angels of heaven when someone turns from their sin and accepts Christ. But what happens in heaven when, 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 when hundreds and thousands of people turn from their sin and embrace Christ? It's a party up in there, right? Right. Amen. So, there's power in God's word proclaimed. Listen, this is not the only time in Scripture. Acts chapter 4. This is so apropos for right now. Acts chapter 4, it was Peter and John, and they were commanded by the authorities, do not preach Jesus. Do not. What did they say? Do you God. think God wants us to obey him or you? I can almost see the sarcasm like going, hmm. <laughs> right? Like Tommy Boy, right? And you're really smart. Who do you think he wants us to obey? Man or God? They go on, they say, we cannot stop telling what we've seen That's in right. Amen. We can't help ourselves, right? So, expect persecution. Respond with the bold proclamation of God's word. Less opinion, less you, more of his word. If you're going to do it in person, or on Facebook, or on Instagram, wherever your chosen avenue is to evangelize the world, they're all good. Just make sure you qu just quote Scripture. What I've found helpful lately is when I quote Scripture back on Facebook, I'll usually follow it up with, you are loved, or have a wonderful day. Right. It's amazing how the rebuttal stops right there. Yes. Right? Because it's the truth spoken in love, done right now there's always going to be the stubborn mule that still says i got another one this morning you got to get that money right okay i'm loaded that's what it's all about you want to look at my car with rot and rust and faded paint a blown engine that's what it's all about it's about the money so there's always going to be people that have opinion because they've never actually come and seen what's going on but they're going to have their opinion but just just respond to it with the word of god quote scripture just let people know hey listen do what you want. I don't judge you. This is just what the Word of God says. Right? That's it. And they can do what they want with you. All right? So expect persecution. Respond. Bold proclamation of God's Word. Okay, here, here's the next thing I see there in, in the text. Just, just looking it over, seeing what's there in the order. It says that when all this happened, they sent um, they sent. Barnabas to Antioch, and when he arrived, he saw this evidence of God's blessing. Some people will 
read a translation that doesn't say blessing, it'll say God's grace, right? God's grace. So um, what are some of the things that, that we usually consider uh, God's blessing, right? Um, money, uh, a nice house, um, a nice job, uh, good health, right? Can those things be blessings? Yeah. Can, can they be blessings? They can be blessings, right? Um, let me just say this, though, about them. You know, you know there's people that, that pray a lot. I'm not, I'm not a big pray a lot guy. I should. I'm, I'm probably not as good as I should be at it. Those people that pray a lot, I know one person who prays a ton. But, but listen, and I'm sure that even the one who prays a lot can, can verify this. Sometimes when you pray, you don't always hear the voice of God. Because there's other voices that are vying for your attention, is there yes. not? Yeah. yeah. So, right. So you have to be very discerning. But there's one way to definitely, absolutely hear the voice of God. It's in your hand. Amen. It's your Bible. Amen. Right? No doubt, that is the voice of God. Amen. Now, the reason why I say that is because money and health and cars and all that, they can be a blessing. For sure, they can be a blessing. But remember the rich young ruler? He was super blessed. So blessed that he turned away from salvation. Right? So that's why the scriptures say if riches increase, don't set your heart upon them. If you have a really nice house, don't set your heart upon it. If you have great health, don't set your heart upon it. If you have great anything that you... Listen, every good and perfect gift comes from above, right? So even if, if, if the money comes at that moment... You can say thank you to God, but don't set your heart upon it because it will turn from a blessing to a curse just like that. Okay? Amen. Just like that. So I'm just saying that salvation and the forgiveness that comes with it every time, all the time, is God's blessing. Amen. 100% of the time. You can't argue with that, okay? It says it in the Word of God. When they saw the evidence, what was the evidence? What did they see here? People, large number of people got saved. They believed and turned to the Lord. And they saw this evidence of God's blessing and they were filled with joy. Okay? So if you want to bless someone, if you want to be a blessing to people, proclaim the word of God to them. Yes. That's the greatest way you can be a blessing. You want to open up your checkbook and write a check? Awesome. You want to buy them lunch? Great. You want to buy them a car? Super. You want to buy them a house? Awesome. You want to be a blessing for sure? Because that could be a curse, right? How many people have watched people? You don't need to tell me. How many people have gotten the lottery and their life completely went to hell? Right? Is every good and perfect gift come from above? Yes. Mm. But they took it and then they set our heart upon it and it ruined them. So just because you get a big old financial blessing, that'd be nice, right? But it doesn't always work out that way. If you really want to be a blessing to someone, share the word of God with them. God's yes. word, his power is in that. It leads to salvation, and yes. that is evidence of God's blessing yes. all the time, every single time. Yes. And that's why mm -hmm. we need to study the, to show yourself approved, able to rightly divide the word of God. Of truth. That's why we're supposed to, and Joshua says, to study the word continually. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 1 said to meditate on his word day and night so we can be agents of God's blessing. That's why. Okay? Amen? Amen. Okay. Well, listen, don't just be hearers of this word, guys. Don't just be hearers of this word. Be doers of this word. Okay? Don't just let the preacher get up here and blow smoke for 45 minutes and go, hey, that was great, and go do the same thing. Expect persecution. Welcome it. Yes. Respond boldly with the word of God and be a blessing to this community. That's how we shepherd a city, okay? Not by writing checks, but by sharing the word of God with them that they might be saved, all right? Okay, so now, now this. Here's just more stuff. Truth shared, examples shown. They saw evidence of God's blessing, and he was filled with joy, this Barnabas, because of that, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the word. Stay true.
to the word. Some translations will say something different. They'll say, uh, remain in the Lord. Some translations will say, abide in the Lord. Okay? This is a, of huge importance. Okay? This is why church, this is why we gather to encourage one another. Okay? That's why you're here. Not just for me to encourage you, but for us to encourage one another. See, that's what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says. It doesn't say to don't neglect the assembly so that someone can preach to you. It says don't neglect the assembly. Why? But instead, what? Encourage one another, especially now since the time is short. Is it about gathering to protect people's physical life? Or is it about gathering to protect your spiritual life, which is forever? The time is short. People need to be saved, not healed of their physical afflictions. That's more important, okay? And so we're supposed to gather together to encourage one another, to stay faithful, to keep submitting, to keep following, to keep giving, to keep praying, to keep reading, right? Listen, if you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior, then listen, you made a good choice, loved one. Yes. You made a good choice. All things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to His purpose. So if you want things to work out for the good, stay faithful to the Lord. Amen. Stay Amen. faithful to the Lord. Now listen, I read the New King James. Anyone have a New King James here in the room? Right. New King James says something a little bit different, and it's a lot stronger. The New King James says that he gathered there and encouraged them, and he says to continue with the Lord. To continue with the Lord. Now this sends us right back to last week's kingdom message when Jesus said these words, and nobody likes it, but he said it, and you can't ignore it. Remember what he says here. Continue with the, with the Lord, Lord, right? Jesus said last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, I think, no. That was tough. Can't remember what it is. I don't know the good, naughty pastor. Mm -hmm. No, it's John chapter 15. Those that are in me, right? If those that are in me do not produce fruit, my Father will cut them off to be thrown into the fire to be burned. Now, this is a non-denominational church. So you can do what you want with that. I, I would plead with you that you do something with that. But to me, the overriding theme of Scripture says, those that are in me, if you don't do what I want, you're done. That's why he said, I'll forgive you on the cross, but you better forgive others or else my Father will not forgive you. Verdict changes. That's just what it said. Like, again, you don't have to believe it, but that's what it says. If you're in me, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 17 says, anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. Yes. Right? That's a saved person, right? If you're in Christ, you're saved. The old has died, behold the new man. And then he comes on in John 15 and says, so anyone who's in me, which is what? Saved. Yes. That doesn't produce fruit gets cut off and thrown to the fire to be burned. Is that dude saved? No. no. Not anymore. And so when, 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 when the New King James says that Barnabas went there and encouraged them, listen, you're, you believed, you turned to the Lord, continue with the Lord. Yeah. And why would he tell him to continue with the Lord if you're so changed at the molecular level that you can't give away your salvation? Why would he tell him to continue with the Lord? Because some of us don't. Hello. And some of us know people, by their fruit, there were no doubt a Christ follower, and something changed, and they went sideways and gave it up. And so, that's why it says, in Matthew 24, out of the mouth of Jesus, many will turn away from the faith. They will turn away from me. How do you turn away from a place you never were? Why does 1 Timothy 4.1 also say many will abandon the faith? 
How do you abandon a faith that you never had? These are things to think about, right? So when you talk about being lukewarm and all that stuff, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <clears throat> this might be why you're here today. You're going through it. A lot of us are going through it right now. Universally, right here in our, in our country, we're going through it. And because of it, we're struggling. We're worried about our health. We're worried about our finances. Don't think for a second that your pastor is supposed to be all full of faith and everything. Listen, my, my, my mortgage is, 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 goes along with our offering too. You don't think this concerns me? I don't know if I'm going to get paid. Listen, I understand. I understand. Many of you are struggling with financial issues and marriages that are a mess and you don't know what to do. You're fearful of this virus. Things are just crazy and you've been praying for these things and, and they haven't improved Maybe you're just thinking this morning that maybe this decision to follow Jesus isn't all it's cracked up to be. Listen, continue with the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Continue yes. with the Lord. All things work out for the good to those who love him and are called to his purpose. His word says that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Those who seek the Lord and trust the Lord will lack no good thing. Continue with the Lord. You made a good decision back when you did it. Continue with the Lord. That's always the best choice. Don't give up. Be encouraged. God is still on his throne, whether we have a virus or not, whether your marriage is struggling, whether your bank book is down. Continue with the Lord and trust him. Yes. We sang Amen. it. Now we have to do it. Okay? Yes. Amen. We did it before. Do it again. Come on, you can do better than that. I did it before. Do it again. Do it again. Okay, do it again. All right. Is there more? There's more here. There's more here. One of the one of the reasons that there's such a lethargy and a complacency within the body of Christ. No one seems to Generally speaking, you all know this, I'm not saying everyone, but generally speaking, the overall, there's a lot of lethargy in the body of Christ. You, know, you don't see like the doors being rushed on Sunday mornings. You remember the story of Jesus when he's, when he's there and he's preaching in that house and the, and the guys lower the dude down through the roof because he was, he was crippled, right? And he forgave him his sins and he healed him. Remember what, the thing that I love, not, not just that, but the, as a church planter, the thing that I love about it is that it said that there was so many people that not only could you not fit in the house, you couldn't even fit in the yard. It said there were so many people that they couldn't even approach the house to listen in through the windows. That's how many people were there. Now, is that the way it is now? If you even say you're having church, you're the enemy. Okay? Jesus. And here we are, right? I love our church. I love you. Ten years in, how many people are here? Twenty? How many people said no to the virus and yes to God in this room? Twenty? Twenty-five people. What's wrong? There's a lethargy in the body of Christ. There's a lethargy in the body of Christ. Amen. One of the things that I see is within the body of Christ that, that shows a complacency. There's a laziness. Um, People are, like, it's okay to wait on the Lord for deliverance, but sometimes people are waiting. Um, they're waiting on the Lord for the wrong reasons. They're waiting to have their Pentecost moment. You know? When they all gather in the upper room, and they're all in one accord, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit blows in the wind, and the building shakes, and the fire tongues come down, right? And they all get filled with the Holy Spirit, and they start speaking in tongues and all this stuff. And some people are waiting for that filling of the Holy Spirit before they'll actually even consider doing something great for the Lord. Now I understand the Bible says in Ephesians 5 verse 18 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? You know that it says that? So there's a command there to be filled. To be filled. 
Okay, God, you heard old Paul. <laughs> Film it. Now, I, I, I'm, this might sound funny, but how many people are actually doing great things for the Lord? Because we're waiting for our Pentecost moment when we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you boldly that that is pure laziness, it's pure convenience, and pure stubbornness. Because that's not it at all. That is not what the Bible teaches in any way, shape, or form. Unless you view it through the lazy version. If that's your Bible, then that's how you view this. But let the Bible speak to you. It says in Scripture to let the Holy Spirit guide you in all that you do. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. That means let, that's a choice, right? That's what the word let is, do you agree? Let the Holy Spirit, which by the way, you got at conversion, Ephesians 1.13 says that God gave you his Holy Spirit when you believe. Now, you have his Holy Spirit, not in a deficit, not a little portion of the Holy Spirit. You got the Holy Spirit. So what I believe he's teaching us here when he says be filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'll show you why, is to let, by choice, the Holy Spirit that you got at conversion take control and direct you in every single thing. Now, this is why I believe this. At Pentecost, when it said that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the Greek word "plato." It's defined not as filled. It's defined as influenced. Look it up in your Strong's Concordance. It means they were influenced by the Holy Spirit. They started doing things because the Holy Spirit was influencing them. But here in this text right here, watch what it says here. It says, Barn verse 24, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. Now in this text, the word full is play race, which means replete, which means completely under the control of. Amen. And Amen. this guy, right, this guy, Barnabas, he lived that way. It didn't say, hey, go find Barnabas, because right now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. It said, go, this guy Barnabas, he's full of it. Amen. 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 Are you full of it? Yes. Right? In Acts chapter 6, when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the people weren't being fed the way some of the, hey Peter, some of the, 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 the believers wanted to be fed, the widows, the Greek widows, right? They weren't being fed properly. They thought, well, we're being overlooked. And the Jewish people are getting food before we do. They start complaining. So what do the apostles do? They say, listen, folks, we're not supposed to be doing a, a food service, the apostles. Okay, we're supposed to pray and, and, and learn the word of God and preach. That's our job, all right? That's my job. So go find seven people that are what? Are full of it. There's a guy who's full of it right there. Just kidding. Love you. That's what happens when you're a guest. Full of what? It says, full of the, go find seven people, one of them was Stephen, that were full of the Holy Spirit. They didn't, they didn't have a moment when they were influenced by the Holy Spirit. No, they lived full of the Holy Spirit. That was their present condition. Hallelujah. Past, Hallelujah. present, future. That's who they were. That was their identity. They were men filled with the Holy Spirit. They were men that let the Holy Spirit take control of every single thing that they said did where they went all of it okay it can be it, this could be you this could be you right here right now okay galatians 5 25 says this since we live by the spirit right you were once dead but now you've been now you're alive in christ you know why you're alive did, did, were you breathing before you said yes to jesus yeah. you were breathing right your heart was beating you were alive right but what made you alive to god is that the holy spirit of god is now in you Yes. That's what Amen. it means, right? So now, since we live by the Spirit, let, there's that choice word again, let us follow the Spirit's leading 
in every part of our life. Yeah. Amen. Right? That's a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's not sitting around waiting like, I know I got saved, the Holy Spirit, I know that you're in there, but would you please fill me up? I'm waiting for you to do something so that I can actually go invite my neighbor to church. No, he's already in there, and you know you're supposed to invite your neighbor to church. Get off your hiney and follow his leading. That's what being filled with the Holy Spirit means. You could be a man or a woman filled with the Holy Spirit. Everything you say, everything you do, everywhere you go, under the control of God's Holy Spirit. That could be you right here, right now. Do you want to be that person? Say, I want to be full of it. I want to be full of it. Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. So again, we're just seeing how people are supposed to respond to who Jesus is. That's what the book of Acts is, right? It's yeah. not, listen, being filled with the Holy Spirit is not some elite club of elders and deacons. It's anyone. Right. You have, if you've bent the knee to Christ, then the reality is it doesn't matter how you feel. If you've bent the knee to Jesus, his Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and he's trying to give you these prompts. His word of God is, is it's, it's swelling up inside of you. You've read it. You know it. You know what you're supposed to do. To be filled means to just obey it, to just obey what it says to do, okay? So again, we're just seeing how people are responding to Jesus. Let's finish up here. We're, uh, look at uh, verse 25. Um, 25. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year. They went to church for a full year teaching large crowds of people. I just look at that. Why, why do big churches get such a bad rap? Why is there such a move away from big churches these days? Oh, because it's not personal. Listen, that's great. The church is not about you. It doesn't make any difference if you like it. How many people really are in charge of deciding what should happen in the church? Raise your hand. Pastor. Not even. Yeah. yeah. What does it say here? It says, it says that, that, that those guys join the church that had a large crowd every week. Tons of people were coming to the Lord. Tons of people were in that church. But yet these big churches get ripped because it's not personal. Because you don't like it. I like small churches. Who cares what you like? Right. Doesn't matter what I like either. I, I like it here. I know you guys. If God decided to put 5,000 people in and I didn't know everybody, boo-hoo to me. It doesn't make any difference. I can still be buddies with you guys, right? I'm not going to know everybody. How many people? How many people? I mean, it doesn't make any difference, right? The more, the better. The more people worshiping Jesus, right? Yeah. That's all. So, but churches get, they get, uh, they get a bad rap. I don't know why. They're supposed to get them. Um, so look, look. let's just keep reading here. During this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Ab Ab Agabus stood up in the meeting and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming. And so the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. They did this in trusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Because um, they're super generous. What does it say they gave? What does it say they gave? All they could. Or as much as they could, yeah. As much as they could. They weren't stingy. They didn't hold back. I don't believe they had offering envelopes that you got to itemize where that goes. Just so modern now, so different. It just says that they brought, you look in the book of Acts chapter two and four, they just brought what they had. They gave it to the elders, and the elders just gave it to whoever was in need. They didn't have an offering envelope that said, okay, here's my 50 bucks. 50 go, uh, 30 goes into the general fund. Uh, 10 goes to men's ministry. Ten, make sure the youth get 10, and then 5 over to, or whatever my math was. I need algebra, obviously. <laughs> 5 goes to missions. What does it say that they did? They just gave it to the leaders and said, we just want to help them. 
I only say that because it's just because money controls us. You need yeah. not only you give yeah. does it hurt to give it, but just as you're giving it, you still have to hold on and go, okay, I'll give this to you, but you're gonna do what I want with it. Oh. You're not giving it up. You're not doing it because you're happy to you're not a cheerful giver that just wants to build the kingdom and help people that are in great need. It owns you. You need to be released from that. They were super generous to those that were in need. That's what the church should be. This is just what a Christian does. This is who a Christian is. They're generous. They give as much as they could. So that's what we do. We go through the text and we see what a Christian's supposed to be, what a Christian's supposed to do. We're just seeing a proper response to Jesus and his commission to make disciples of all people be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. We want to see what that looks like. And so we want to, first of course, we want to be bold, right? We want to be bold. We want to share the word of God boldly, even when we're told not to, even when we're outnumbered, even when we're unwelcomed, even when it seems like a waste of time, because in the face of persecution, the bold proclamation of God's word carries with it God's power. Yes. God's power. So we want to be bold. We want to be a blessing. We want to seek ways to be a blessing to others by offering salvation in Jesus, by sharing the word of God with them. Be bold, be a blessing, and be filled. Be a person who's filled with the Holy Spirit by choosing to let the Spirit lead you always in all things. Be bold, be blessed, be a blessing, be filled. And last, be generous. Most often the grace of God is delivered through his people. It's not manna coming down from heaven. And that's why I said to be aware of those around you so that nobody misses the grace of God. When he prompts you by his spirit to be generous, make sure you respond well so there's provision for all the people that are in need. Okay? So... There you have it. The word of God has been exposed to you, and now the people of God must choose to obey it. Amen. 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 All right, well, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Father, we uh, thank you for your word. I thank you for these faithful saints of God who are here, eager to hear, and I believe eager to submit to you, respond to you well. It's clear in your word the type of people you want us to be. And so help us now, Lord, where we are weak and we don't want to obey because we're rubbed the wrong way and I don't want to do that and I don't know if it's going to work out well. Again, continue with the Lord. Continue with the Lord. Stay true to the Lord, loved ones. So, Father, we need help with that because it's very difficult sometimes to be obedient to you. Your bar, your bar is high. And we walk pretty low often. And so help us to rise up and to live up to the expectations that you have set forth for us in your word. Thank you for speaking to us today, letting us gather here. And Lord, I want to just say we want your blessing on our food as we get done here with our message from your word and we're going to sing another song and all, but then we're going to eat. And Lord, we ask that your blessing would be upon us. Help us to eat fearlessly. Help us to eat lovingly. Let our time together be a blessing and a joy to all of us. And Lord, let it please you when you see your church gathered in your name, doing as you ask us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, let's, um, I'm just going to leave this here as far as our offering goes instead of passing it around. There's a